All right, welcome everyone. Welcome to our monthly College of Natural Sciences webinar. My name is Allison Sherwood. I'm the Interim Associate Dean for the College of Natural Sciences. And through this Pilina A webinar series, we are aiming to reach the broader community and share the world-class research that happens here in the College of Natural Sciences and around the Manoa campus. Today's presentation features Dr. Eleanor Hegland, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Chemistry here in the College of Natural Sciences at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Dr. Hagland joined the University of Hawaii in August 2018 as an assistant professor in chemistry. Her work is focused on a combination of molecular dynamics simulations and in vitro biophysical characterization of the folding and function of proteins with a so-called pierce lasso topology. Prior to joining UH, Dr. Hagland was a postdoctoral researcher at Rice University and the Center for Theoretical Biological Physics from 2015 to 2018, and at the University of California at San Diego from 2010 to 2015. It was during this time that she discovered the novel PLT proteins and the molecular mechaniz mechanisms important for the biology of proteins. Dr. Hagland completed her PhD in biochemistry at Stockholm University in March 2010, where she studied how proteins spontaneously fold into their active three-dimensional structure within a biologically reasonable time. This is an important question as fundamental knowledge about how nature has overcome the topological and kinetic barriers is much needed. Her PhD work provides vital information for protein misfolding disorders, which enhances our abilities to rationally manipulate cellular life by engineering protein folding groups. And so now I'd like to turn our time over to Dr. Hagland for her presentation entitled Topological Twists in Nature. Welcome, Dr. Hagland. Thank you so much for that nice introduction. Let me see, I should share this as a slideshow. Oh, not presenter view maybe. Play from start, is this good? Perfect. So thank you so much for coming today and thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very excited to share the work that we do in the Hagman Group. And today you will hear a lot about protein folding, function and misfolding, talking about proteins like leptin and obesity, chemokines and cancer and inflammation and superoxide dismutase and its role in tuberculosis. We'll start with a brief introduction. We'll talk about protein folding and its important role in human health, complex topologies, and particularly the pierce lasso topology that I discovered during my postdoctoral training working with Dr. Jose Onochek and Dr. Patricia Jennings at Rice University and UCSD. We'll talk about the three model systems we study in my lab, and we'll end with a brief conclusion. Many times when people ask me what I do and I say that I study proteins, they say, oh, cool what protein shake should I take? Or what's the best nutritional source for proteins if I work out a lot? I just want all of us to keep in mind that proteins do more than just support muscle contraction and support the body's bodily functions every day and phys the physique of us moving and standing up. They're actually workhorses of the cell and they're essential for life. Protein help in the digestive system. They're the antibodies of our immune system. They control and regulate DNA and RNA and protein expression. They provide support to our bodies. They're the hormones to help coordinate bodily functions. And they are actually essential for molecules moving around our bodies. As a protein biochemist, we throw things around and we say words like central dogma and the life of a protein. So before we talk about the research, I want to talk a little bit about what this means. So the central dogma starts with how one cell is duplicated to an identical copy of itself. The DNA gets replicated so that both cells have identical copies of the chromosomes and the DNA that the original cell had. That is called replication, and that is not the part of the central dogma we will discuss today. More interestingly to us is the transcription of DNA into messenger RNA. The mRNA gets translocated from the nucleus to the cytosol where it gets picked up by the ribosome, the factory of making proteins. The three letter codes from RNA gets translated into the 20 naturally occurring amino acids that forms a polypeptide chain. The interesting question in my everyday life is that how do proteins fold from a three dimensional to into a three dimensional structure from a random coil? Another interesting aspect, can you see the slides to the right? 
is the life of a protein. It starts with the central dogma, protein synthesis and protein folding. We also have to be stable enough to perform our biological function. The three-dimensional structure is also important for the biological function. And we can't stay functional forever. So proteins need to be degraded and broken down to amino acids again. So if we take the example of leptin, the protein that we work with in my lab. Leptin is a protein, all of us have the identical protein of 146 amino acids that needs to fold into a four helix bundle composed of a Pierce lasso topology. And we'll talk about that later. So 99.9% .9 of all of our DNA is the same, even though we look differently. So every time I eat, this protein called leptin needs to be produced in my fat cells, secreted to the extracellular matrix go all the way to my brain, bind to receptors to initiate signaling. We can't feel full forever. We need to control energy expenditure. So the protein needs to be broken down after it has initiated this phosphorylation cascade that leads to signal, stop eating your full. So when that happens, it gets degraded. So proteins have something called a half-life, which means half of the proteins are cleared from the serum. In the case of leptin, this happens in about 25 minutes meaning that the life of a protein is exist for about 50 minutes in our bodies. Also important to know, proteins fold within milliseconds to seconds. So if we take the example and the kinetic experiments we performed in my lab, we know that leptin can fold and unfold within milliseconds. So if leptin exists for 50 minutes, it can actually fold and unfold if this was a continuous process more than 1,500 times for each and every molecule of leptin all the time we produce it. So it's very important to understand how, how and why proteins fold. Oops. The field of protein folded started already in the 50s and 60s where two really smart scientists came out with a paradox and an experiment that initiated the field of protein folding. Leventhal stated that protein folding cannot be a random process. And his logic was, if we take an amino acid chain of 100 amino acids, and a bead of strings, and we have 100 beads on the string, every bead can try two different conformations to test and see if that lowers the free energy for the protein to fold. That would make up two to the power of 100 possibilities, and it will take longer time to fold one protein than it took to form the universe. We do know that proteins fold within milliseconds to seconds, so we know that protein folding cannot be a random process. We have to have a code somewhere hidden in the amino acid sequence, determining what type of three-dimensional structure do I need and how do I fold there within the milliseconds so that I can be functional. To test the functionality, Amphinson said, can a protein unfold and refold and still be functional? So he took alpha ribonuclease A, he tested the activity of the protein, put it in a test tube, added chemical denaturing, which breaks all the native contacts, so we're back to random chain again, or a random coil. He let the protein then refold in refolding buffer and tested the activity again. And he found out that proteins can reversibly fold and unfold inside a test tube without the assistance of any other proteins called chaperones or any co-proteins that assist in folding. So this is how the field was initiated because we know these experiments. So why is it important to know how proteins fold? What happens when it goes wrong inside the cell? That's when it leads to misfolding of proteins that could lead to aggregation or fibrillation inside the cell that could cause proteinopathies or amyloidosis or protein misfolding disorders. Most of you have probably heard of Alzheimer's disease where the tau protein actually form this type of aggregates that are toxic to the cell. The aggregates clump together into fibers. And as you can see in the figures, the Alzheimer brain has big black holes in the image where the fibers have actually destroyed the tissues of the brain, leading to different phenotypes and different um, progression of memory loss and Alzheimer's disease. Another example is a protein called superoxide dismutase that we have in the cytosol. SOD converts reactive oxygen species that occurs in our bodies every time we go through inflammation. So SOD converts these toxic reactive oxygen species to non-toxic water and hydrogen peroxide to protect the cell. When things go wrong and the protein misfolds, it leads to neurodegenerative disorders like amyloacular sclerosis and ALS, which actually breaks down the nerve cells until we don't get the signal to breathe and it eventually leads to death. 
I am sure you guys have also heard of alpha synuclein, the formation of aggregates called Lewy bodies and Parkinson's disease, insulin and type 2 diabetes, Creutzfeldt Jakob disease or mad cow disease, or prion disease. There are more than 55 known human proteins that lead to amyloidosis, aggregation, and fiber formation in humans, causing severe uh, health problems or even death. So understanding the molecular details on how proteins fold will help us in understanding why and how misfolding occurs and how we can and why we can prevent proteinopathies to cure or prevent proteinopathies. So protein folding and the funnel theory, bear with me here. Let's see if I can explain this. The simplest case of a protein, we can populate two different free energy states. The first one, we talk about the random coil. That's what we call the unfolded state or the denatured state, D in the energy diagram. We can also populate the native state, which is the most stable state in nature. Like any chemical reaction, we have a transition state between the two states. The transition state is not something that we can observe experimentally. So this protein is considered a two-state protein and protein folding occurs as a cooperative process with an all or nothing reaction. So we're either unfolded or refolded. The funnel theory was developed by Dr. Jose Onochik and Dr. Peter Wallenis and their co-workers in the 90s, where we describe how folding actually occurs. So the smooth funnel, if we look at that first, if you consider this, the denatured state is a random coil that can populate many different conformations. We have lots of um, entropy, meaning that is very disorganized system. We can put um, a similar context. If you think about a little ball or a golf ball, if you have a funnel and you throw in the ball, it will keep spinning until it has the perfect energy to fold down the funnel. The same goes for proteins. To find that perfect energy, we actually find the native contacts. The code for that is in the amino acid sequence and not a random process. We minimize the entropy of the system, gaining the energy to climb up the free energy barrier. So the bottleneck of the funnel represents the transition state, and the native state is the lowest energy state in the bottom of the funnel. Again, this is the simplest case. Nature is not always simple, even though it's very smart but many proteins introduce ruggedness on the landscape where we could have kinetic traps or intermediate states. So what can increase ruggedness of the landscape? I already mentioned proteins with an intermediate state. This is something that causes a minima and ruggedness on the free energy landscape where we could um, introduce complex states and complexity into the folding landscape that may or may not lead to higher um, possibilities of misfolding for proteins. It was not until early 2000 or late 1900s, it was proposed that proteins can actually tie themselves into knots. It took a while for people to agree on this um, hypothesis, but today I believe that it's a well-known fact that protein backbones can actually entangle themselves into knots. The question is, why does nature do that? How does nature do that? What gives it the energy to actually self-tangle? Also, are there natural entanglements in nature? Does topology play an important role in our everyday life? So looking at the state of Hawaii and historically, knots and ropes were introduced by humans many, many years ago. They were there to support, um, support a sail, support uh, a fishing knot, uh, to connect the fishing hook with the line. It was there for weaving. Is something that we use in art, in culture, and in everyday life. For example, tying our shoelace, which we'll talk about in a second. There are entanglements in nature all over Hawaii. This is photos taken at Manoa Falls. However, we believe that trees and roots and plants and flowers do randomly just tie themselves into knots trying to reach the sun. Another good example to talk about everyday life is earbuds with a cord. I bet you most of us don't even think about how it happens, but we all know the frustration of pulling up the cords from our pocket. It has a million different entanglements and knots in there. But it's interesting to think about this fact as a scientist. Actually, you put a, a linear chain inside your pocket and the kinetic energy and the friction would actually help to form these different types of entanglements. Many, many years ago, mathematicians said, 
let's think about topology. Can we describe different topologies and knots in nature, in science? So they came up with this knot diagram, which is still what we use today. So the first example is something called an unknot or a zero knot, where we have a full circle and nothing is threaded through. This is not considered a knot in terms of mathematics. The 3 1 knot is the simplest knot. As you can see, it's a circle. We don't have any open ends in this knot diagram. The number three stands for we have three crossings. If you look at it, we have one crossing here, second and third crossing. And we can describe this into more and more complex topologies. So to me, it's really fascinating how we can use the culture and the art and the nature from Hawaii to understand scientific, very complex theories like knots in proteins and not in nature. When it comes to proteins though, as I said, what is a knot? So here's a little rope, see if I can do this in front of you guys. If we take a chain and we tie it into three one knot and we put it together as a circle that they did in the knot diagram, we see that we have an entanglement in the middle. It doesn't matter if I pull, wiggle or whatever I do, the knot stays intact. This is defined as a knot according to mathematician. And this actually blew my mind when I learned about this. But we know as kids, our parents and grandparents teaches us how to tie your shoelace. But what do we do when we tie a shoelace? We create a loop that we thread through, we think. So the mathematical definition, we put in the N and C terminal together, I pull and the knot should stay intact, which is not the case. So we do not tie our shoelaces into a knot. We thread the topology, but it's something that mathematicians call a slip knot. And those are different. So going back to proteins, they do not have enclosed N and C terminal. So to use the knot theory and the knot diagram, we have to entangle the protein, pretend that we connect the N and C terminal somewhere in infinity to define a knot. And there are now algorithms to do so because they're really hard to find if you just visually look at a structure, it's really hard to find them. So this is the defini definition that we use in science and also in proteins. So like I said, the first knotted protein was discovered in 1994. It had a 3-1 topology where the protein crossed itself three times. The other type of knotted proteins that is accepted today is the slip knotted protein. As you can see in the diagram down here, it's really hard to see that this protein is an actual knot. It's a slip knot, so when I pull the chain, it will actually come off. So it's not a true knotted protein, even though it's classified as knots in proteins. There are two more classes I would like to mention before we talk about PLTs. Another class is so-called lasopeptides. Lasopeptides have a covalent bond, an isopeptide bond, a side chain mediated bond that is created by a co-expressed enzyme. These peptides are short, about 20 amino acids long, and they're only existing in bacteria. So I have a little zip tie here. If this represents the actual bond that we have in the lasso peptide. We believe that these proteins do not thread. We think that they fold first into the correct topology, and then you clip it in like a seatbelt so that it stays hooked up or tangled at all times until an enzyme actually breaks this bond. That's why we don't talk about threading for these proteins, because we don't believe they thread in nature. They're assisted with enzymes belting or clipping in the disulfide as the last event on the folding route. There's another class called cysteine knots that we see in venomous toxins a lot because they're super stable. They have three disulfide bonds. A disulfide bond is created under oxidizing environments, and we'll talk about that in a few slides too. So cysteine knots has a covalent loop formed by two disulfide bonds, and you can see the red structure which is describing the threaded element. In the case of cysteine knots, the threaded part is a third disulfide bond. So if we add reducing environments here, all three bonds will fall apart and the protein will just collapse into a random unfolded chain. And we cannot study threading for these proteins. No matter if the bond is a disulfide bond or an amide bond for the last of peptides, these post-translational bonds formed um, after um, the central dogma would create covalent loops in proteins. To try to describe the topology of these knots or threaded topologies, or we have the linker in yellow and the white circles are amino acids. 
So if the bond is somewhere at the N and C terminus of the protein, the start and the end of the protein, it will form that zero knot that I mentioned earlier is not actually a knot. If it's somewhere in the sequence with two open ends that actually can have the possibility to thread in later, or they can be at the N or the C terminal of the protein. This is not unique to Peer's laws of topologies at all. They exist in any protein, and this, uh, um, the length of the loop depends on the sequence separations between the two amino acids forming that covalent linker. So what is unique to PLTs? Something is actually threaded through the loop. So what we have here is a disulfa bond in the case of our proteins that forms a covalent loop where something is threaded through. So there are two ways I can thread through this loop. I can either take the terminal end and plug it through, or I can do like we do with a shoelace, I slip knot through. So we talk a lot about the mechanism of threading. Where do we recruit the energy to thread? Why did nature do this? And why do they exist? These are questions we try to answer in my lab by using these knot diagrams and trying to understand how proteins fold and thread into these threaded topologies. So disulfide bonds, for those of you who don't know, are formed between two cysteine residues that have active thiol groups because of the oxidizing environments that exist in the cell or the extracellular matrix or in the compartment where the protein exists. They can also be assisted by glutathione and thyroidoxin like you see in the figure. So if you're, for example, a protein that exists in the cytosol where we have a reducing environment, disulfide bonds can still be formed with the help of glutathione and thyroidoxin but not without these two proteins. The other issue is that the two cysteines have to be closed in space for them to form the bond. They may or may not form threaded topologies, and the bond is promoted or obstructed depending on the cellular compartments. So post-translation modification of disulfa occurs beyond the central dogma, something we call post-translation modification, and they can be made and broken throughout the lifetime of a protein. Why is this interesting? Like I said, I discovered this in the satiety hormone leptin, but if it only exists in one protein, why should people care? So together with my collaborator, Dr. Joanna Sokalska at the University of Warsaw, we came up with an algorithm where we can actually search through the PDB and see if there are other proteins that has the same topology. Criteria number one is that I have a disulfide bond forming a covalent loop. Criteria number two is if we look at this covalent loop as a plane, we can see if something is crossing the plane. And when we did this, we found that more than 600 proteins within the protein data bank, the PDB, has a Pierce Lasso topology. Uh, this represents 18% of all the proteins with the disulfide bond that we know of today, which is a huge class. I talked about knots in protein and how important they are, and they represent about 4% of all known protein structures. Interestingly, these proteins exist in all kingdoms of life, they have many different biological functions classified into 14 different groups, and they do exist in different cell compartments. This is really interesting. Like I said, we know the extracellular matrix is oxidizing environment, promoting disulfides. We know that the, the cytosol is reducing environment, obstructing the formation of the bond. We still ask the question, what is the role of Pierce lasso topologies? The hypothesis is PLTs stabilize proteins, control biological activity through the conformational dynamics, which is the way the molecule move in solution because it's not a rigid structure. Is it protecting from degradation the breakdown of the proteins? We have researched this and we have looked into three different model systems using different biophysical and biological characterizations of proteins. We use structure-based simulations where we look at the bond, the angle and the dihedrals for the amino acids in the protein in its native state and its denatured state. We use kinetic and thermodynamic experiments utilizing circular dichroism or fluorescence experiments. We use nuclear magnetic resonance and electron microscopy to look at protein structures and protein dynamics, biological activity assays in human cell lines to study the activity of the proteins we work on. I'm not gonna go into detail. So if you guys have questions, I'd be happy to answer them after my talk. So talking about the first hypothesis, PLTs are introduced to increase protein stability. What is protein stability? 
we look at the free energy diagram again. The delta G or the stability for a protein from the denatured to the native state is the difference in free energy between the two states. A bigger gap is a more stable protein, which means we're more likely to find a protein in the native state than in the unfolded state. For example, if a protein has stability of six, it means that one molecule out of a hundred or out of a million, because it's a logarithmic scale, will be unfolded at all times. Like I said, proteins unfold and refold all the time throughout the lifetime of, of the protein, depending on the stability difference between the two states. So to test this, we use our model system and we engineer proteins that have disulfide bonds because we believe that disulfide bonds or generally disulfide bonds enhance stability, not always, but in general, they make proteins more stable. So the question we wanted to ask is, if the threaded topology adds something to that stability, or if the effect comes directly from the disulfide bond. So in the first plot I'm gonna show you, we have our pierce lasso topology with one disulfide bond where the protein is threaded through. We create a zero knotted protein where the entire protein is a circle. Nothing can be threaded through. And then we created a different pierce lasso variant. So to the right, I'm showing you leptin where we have these proteins. And I'm showing you the equilibrium data uh, observed from fluorescence experiments. And that's why you see the two sigmoidal curves going in different directions for two different protein systems. The top one is fluorescence, the bottom one is circular dichrism, explaining the denatured population compared to the native population. So to the top where we have low denaturant, the protein is folded. At the bottom at high denaturant, the protein's unfolded for both plots. It's just the reverse signal. There's a low signal from CD, when the protein is folded and a high signal where it's unfolded. So looking at these two plots, we can see that all the plots at the top basically overlap. They both require the same amount of denaturant to unfold the protein. We can also calculate the stability in the delta G and we see that they're within the experimental error. So there are no significant changes if we break the threaded topology by forming a zero knotted protein. The same is true for the protein at the bottom. Here we have the wild type protein with two disulfide links, so it's a double linked protein. So no matter if I break the top disulfide or the bottom, you can see that the gray and the orange actually overlap. So we're showing for the first time here that the pierce lasso topology does not affect stability. It's more uh, attributed to the fact that we have or we don't have a disulfide bond when we talk about protein stability for these two proteins. The second hypothesis is about conformational dynamics. So this is our experimental NMR nuclear magnetic resonance data and our simulations of leptin. So you can see the different possible structures that happen, meaning that the protein molecule vibrates or it breathes. You can see that the red parts up here are very dynamic, moving a lot, while the parts down here do not move as much. And we can plot that data. To investigate this, we use structure-based models again. So looking at the plot to the right, we have the sequence of leptin at the bottom. Leptin has a pierce lasso topology. And then we look at the amplitude in angstroms, how much it's the molecule new moving when we let it sit in the native state compared to the crystal structure. So the red plot that you see at the top represents the oxid dyes protein with the pierce lasso topology. If we break the disulfide, the protein is a linear protein, just like all the other proteins in nature. So it does not have a threaded topology, which is what you see in blue. The yellow line is just representing the difference between red and blue. So studying leptin and all 12 other proteins with a PLT that we did in the study, it all showed that when we have a pierce lasso topology, we have a global effect across the entire molecule changed in the conformational dynamic, depending if I'm threaded or I'm not threaded. Taking it four proteins that has a covalent loop inside of them, but nothing is threaded through. The terminals are outside the covalent loops. We don't form the threaded element. Shows that we only have changes in conformational dynamics in the area where the disulfide previously was. We can all imagine if we connect something, we change the entropy of the system. So when we break it, we do move, move more in the region where we previously had the bond. So we can understand why we increase the conformational dynamics just locally if we have the bond or if the, we break the bond. But the rest of the molecule moves in the same way. So we hypothesis 
hypothesize that conformational dynamic is affected by the thread topology. And that is maybe why nature introduced PLTs. Also in terms of protein degradation, this is a hypothesis hypothesis that's being tested. So unfortunately, I cannot give you any answers here today. But to think about the problem, proteosomal degradation occurs through a pore. You see the proteasome to the right of the slide. It's a narrow pore. So if we go back and I have a covalent loop that has to thread through a pore, maybe it's blocked just by the fact that I have the disulfide bond, or maybe a disulfide protein can be squeezed through the pore. So we want to test that hypothesis compared to when we have a threaded element where we actually create a larger volume that we can't squeeze together in the same way as the non-threaded topology to see how that affects proteasomal degradation. This can be done by using the same proteins I showed in the previous slide. We can create the full circle and we can create different threaded topologies within the same protein and then study how that affects degradation. Interestingly, any protein that is secreted, which a lot of the PLTs are because they contain disulfides, go through the ER Golgi pathway before they are secreted. Inside the ER Golgi pathway, we have oxidizing environment that promote the formation of the bond. We also have plenty and high concentrations of thyroidoxin and glutathione that can help to make and break the bond and giving the protein a second chance to refold if the disulfide bond was formed incorrectly. Inside the ER, we do not have any proteasomal degradation. So for a protein to be degraded and not secreted, we have to shuffle it back to the cytosol. Again, this happens through a pore. Many of the channels to move between compartments are actually protein pores, making it possibly complicated for proteins to be degraded. How is this important in human health? Of the 600 proteins that we discovered with PLTs, many are cell signaling proteins, bacterial or viral proteins involved in many known human disorders. So we find it interesting to connect the link also between PLTs and human health. Unhealthy conditions in the cell is, are represented during inflammation or cancer. During inflammation, we change the, the, the expression, the upregulation and downregulation of glutathione and thyroidoxin that can help with the formation and the breakage of the bond, the covalent bond we're talking about. Also, during oxidative stress, we increase the, the molecules, the reactive oxygen species, ROS, toxic to the cell. This can have an effect on protein folding as well, and this can change the um, formation and, and the obstruction of the covalent bond that we have in the Pierce-Lasso topologies. During hypoxia, we also minimize the oxygen in the cell, which happens also during inflammation and cancer. And this also has an effect of, I apologize, to the, the expression of glutathione and thyroidoxin. For instance, the protein that breaks down the reactive oxygen species, I mentioned that is superoxide dismutase. Superoxide dismutase in human exists in the cytosol. And that is also a protein that has a pierce lasso topology. So it cannot have the disulfide there unless we have the presence of glutathione or thyroidoxin that can promote the formation of the bond. In humans, this protein has an extra zinc molecule that is not important for the chemistry. That is the copper molecule of this protein. So we believe the zinc molecule may or may not be there to help the protein to maintain this conformational dynamics in the case that thyroidoxin and glutathione are, are not there. And in learning about the system, we're studying the zinc-free MT SOD, which is the protein for M tuberculosis. And I will end this presentation talking about that system. So like I said, in the Haglund group, we use three different model systems to understand protein folding and function and the hypothesis that PLTs may act as molecular switches, where we can fine tune and turn biological activity on and off depending on the chemical environment. Obesity is something that everyone is aware of. It's a huge problem, not only in the world, but also here in America. I think I just read a number that about 40% of the populations in some state are actually obese people, and many of them are severely obese. Severe obesity lead to, may lead to cancer, inflammation, heart disease, and sometimes also death. 
So it's an extremely important disease to understand why people overeat. Why don't we feel the signal of satiety anymore? And this is something we're really interested in understanding in my lab. It also costs society billions of dollars every year trying to cure people or trying to cure humans that inadvertently end up in a severe obese state. So leptin was discovered in 1994 by Dr. Jeffrey Friedman in his lab. They saw that some of the mice used in the Jackson lab were severely obese. For cancer research, these are not healthy mice, so they were thrown out from the study. Jeffrey Friedman and his cohorts said, why don't we study these mice? Why are some of them obese? And they discovered the gene that expresses the protein leptin. It's made in our fat cells, adipose tissue. It's secreted to our bloodstream where it travels, crosses the blood-brain barrier to reach the membrane-bound receptors in hypothalamus to initiate a phosphorylation casket saying, stop eating your full. And this is the protein controlling energy expenditure. Not much is known about the human protein, the ligand and the receptor, leptin and its receptor. How does it work? What is interacting with what? If we can understand the molecular details, possibly can we come up with a drug that can enhance the signaling of leptin? So I made this animation together with Stefan at Biological Discovery, trying to explain what's going on. So what you see here is, first of all, the gray matter is the cell membrane of hypothalamus. We see two extra cellular parts of two receptors, where we have seven domains. Leptin has now crossed the blood band barrier and it binds to the receptor and initiates a huge conformational change where the whole receptors move and we bind two leptin molecules to two receptors. We believe that this is the sequence of binding and this is needed for leptin signaling. Once you have the rearrangements outside the cell, you have conformational changes inside the cell leading to phosphorylation of DAC, leading to phosphorylation, dimerization of STAP, acting as a transcription factor in the nucleus to produce POMC and MPY, and they keep the signaling going. It's not specific to the JAT signaling pathway. It actually turns out three other signaling pathways, making the protein pleiotropic. They have effect on cell proliferation and cancer as well. And we have a feedback inhibition expressing a molecule called SOC3 that stops the signaling. So this is what we hypothesis, hypothesize happening in the case of leptin and its receptor. We are in the progress of trying to come up with the, trying to solve the structure using cryo-EM because the protein is really large. There is a microscopy figure of mouse protein, but there's no actual structural evidence for the human protein. So in a combination with in silico simulations, NMR and cryo-EM is how we're trying to understand which molecular details controls leptin signaling. When we talk about obesity, there are actually different types of obesity. And I don't know if you have thought about that previously. We have the diet induced obesity and we have genetic obesity. The majority of obesity cases in the world are unfortunately from diet induced obesity. And we do not understand why the chemical signaling does not work in your brain. The other variant is something we call genetic obesity. That means we have genetic effects either on leptin or the leptin receptor. These are extremely rare disorders where you're born at natural weight and you explode as early as a couple months old and you just keep gaining weight and gaining weight and gaining weight and there's no way to stop it. Unfortunately, these patients or these humans usually also develop sequential disorders and they're all inferred on. As of today, we can cure people with leptin deficiency, but we cannot cure people with leptin receptor or downstream signaling molecules like COMC deficiency. There is unfortunately no cure at all today. I met some of these kids and they are constantly starving, even though they're gaining weight. So every second of every day, if you're leptin or leptin receptor if deficient, you feel the same way you and I would feel if we don't eat at all for two weeks and there's nothing to stop it. Unless you have a leptin deficiency. Successfully, we have given patients leptin the same way you give insulin to a diabetic person and cured the disease. And these kids, if it happens before puberty, they actually enter puberty and get well. In other cases, 
unfortunately, there is no cure. There are two different types of leptin deficiency, and we published a paper um, uh, a couple of years ago where we looked into these mutations. First of all, classic leptin deficiency. We take a blood sample, we don't see any protein, you're leptin deficient, makes sense. The second option is something that was more debatable, and I hope our, our research actually showed that we need to do more things than just take a blood sample because there's something called functional leptin deficiency, where we express, produce fully functional, fully folded protein, but not functional protein. So if we rely on tests of protein in serum like ELISA or tests where we use antibodies to see if you have protein, yes or no answers, we will not detect leptin deficiency. We have to use translational science and use the human genome project and actually screen DNA from any patients. This is not done unless the doctors strongly believe you're leptin deficient. The first thing is to take a blood sample. The second thing is to do the DNA testing. And even in, in societies like Sweden, this girl that I met, it took them five years to classify her leptin receptor deficiency because it takes that long before they actually do the DNA tests. So these are non-functional leptin. They have perfectly folded proteins, almost identical to the wild type protein. However, they have mutations probably in that pocket that binds to the receptor, either forming the one-to-one -one complex or the two-to-two -two complex. They have problems with stability, which is actually the biggest cause of disease. Lowering that global stability of proteins many times lead to disease because it's much more possible to find the protein in the unfolded state. It's in the unfolded state I can get degraded. It's the unfolded state means I have to refold and I have the risk of misfolding along the way to, fold it, to the folded state again. So translation of science uh, is really important in my world. It's also really important to find new ways of researching obesity. So in doing so, I met with a phenomenal professor here at UA, it's Dr. Joanne Yu, who actually works with fruit flies. And together with Ned and Margaret, also use former uh, professors here at UH, we decided to test the hypothesis. Can we use Drosophila to study obesity? There is a leptin analogous protein in d melanogastric called unpaired protein one. And we found some papers published in 2018 that you can knock down UPD1 in fruit flies and they actually form obese phenotypes. So Dr. Yu actually performed the experiments and she was able to knock it out. Our part of this project, um, doing in vitro and computer simulations, we took leptin and this structure to the right is actually the crystal structure of leptin. There's something today called AlphaFold and AlphaFold2 developed by Google, which is a phenomenal tool to predict protein structures. So we use this tool to predict the structure of UPD-1, where the blue parts are the most confident areas of prediction, turning into red when we're less confident. So with this prediction, it looks like leptin forms a four helix bundle or a helical protein that has a pierce loss of poly, just like the human protein. Look at the receptors, we can do the same thing and predict them. However, prediction tools are only a hypothesis and they need to be tested experimentally. One example of that is the seven extracellular domains that I showed you. This helical part is actually inside the membrane, but in the prediction it wraps up and the intracellular part wraps around the extracellular part of the protein, showing how extremely hard it is to predict a protein structure. So we're trying to get the actual structure uh, in a collaboration with Slack, and we're building up that project as we speak, and we're trying to see if we can solve the cryo -EM structure of the leptin receptor complex of the extracellular part of the protein to understand how it works. But in terms of Drosophila, we can use the technique and utilize circular diacrism, which is a measurement of secondary structures. So you see the spectrum for the human protein versus the spectrum from Drosophila protein, there is one of the minima that gets pushed up, which is indicative of still a helical structure, which is what AlphaFold predicted. The Drosophila proteins are in general larger than the human proteins, containing more unstructured regions. And that is actually what AlphaFold predicted. And that is also what we would uh, hypothesize from looking at the spectrum. The second minima usually gets up and um, lifts up a little bit in a circular diaphragm spectrum, indicative of more unstructured regions. So this is a work in progress. 
But the interesting part here is when Joanne knocked out UPD-1 in neurons in the fruit flies here in Hawaii, she actually was able to get an obese phenotype that we can use in our research about obesity. I think this is pretty phenomenal because now we can actually study all the genetically engineered proteins that we have in my lab, all the prediction we do in an in vivo model that is similar to humans. 70% of the Drosophila genome is something that we share with humans and Drosophila. So this is phenomenal. And this is an ongoing project that we are very fascinated and very excited about conducting research in the next couple of years and see what we can learn using a simple model system as a fruit fly instead of mice models to study obesity. I also mentioned the other proteins and I'll go through it really quickly because we have about five, 10 minutes. We study chemokines and cancer and inflammation. And this is also a distribution from the CDC and how it looks in the state of the United States. So we do know that cancer and inflammation has a huge impact on human health. What are chemokines? They're small chemoattractants that guide and migrate cells to the spot of inflammation. So they're part of the immune system, guiding the white blood cells to the spot of inflammation to cure inflammation, both in the disease state and in the healthy state. We know that chemokines are effects, uh, misfolding of chemokines affects many different types of cancer. In particular, in my lab, we study the chemokine receptor, CXCR2, and its ligands involved in skin cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, uh, breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, and ovarian cancer. The chemokine receptors are G protein coupled membrane bound receptors that the ligand binds to. Interestingly, this is a very complex system. So this is just describing the system again. This is the neutrophil with the cell surface containing the CXCO2 receptor. CXCO2 has seven ligands that binds to one receptor. In my lab, we study three of the ligands, CXCL1, 5, and 8. They, can, they are expressed and they can function both as a monomer, a homodimer, where two CXCL1 molecules bind to each other, or a heterodimer, where one CXCL1 and one CXCL5 forms a dimer, or CXCL1 and CXCL8, or CXCL5 and CXCL8, and so on and so forth. So we don't know why. We don't know what the activities are. We don't know what the binding affinities are. We don't know why nature developed this intricate network. To make it more complex, there are 50 chemokine ligands that can bind to 18 different receptors. So if we do the math together, that means we have 50 monomers that can bind to 18 receptors, forming 900 different monomer receptor interactions. We also have homodimers and heterodimers forming over 22,000 different combinations, which means the chemokine network is comprised of almost 24,000 different ligand receptor partners. How can we research this without using computer simulations? Luckily, my friend and coworker, Dr. Farouk Marcos at UT Dallas is an expert in coevolution and direct coupling analysis. So together we're developing this methodology where we can use sequence-based and also structure-based um, information, creating multiple sequence alignment using coevolution and evolutionary data and alpha fold to predict the possible interaction partners that we then can test in my lab. Lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit about MTSOD, superoxide dismutase from the M tuberculosis bacteria. As we know, M uh, tuberculosis is also an important um, disease or an important in human health. Tuberculosis bacteria invades our lungs and causes tuberculosis. We all know about COVID, masks, social distancing, same thing almost with bacteria and viruses. So social distancing actually helps. Once we get the bacteria in our lungs, their superoxide dismutase sits on the surface and not in the cytosol that it does for humans. So when our bodies then is gonna protect the host, throwing these reactive oxygen species at the bacteria, the protein just breaks them down to non-toxic species. And then the bacteria survive in our lung. It's very interesting because we're interested also in the fact that we have this PLT and the zinc molecule that I talked about earlier. Human and MTSOD are extremely similar when it comes to structure. 
is just the fact that the tuberculosis protein lacks the zinc site. This possibly comes from evolution, since um, tuberculosis bacteria live in a zinc-deprived environment. So we're interested in what does the zinc molecule do to the human protein? What does the PLT do? Is it protecting and helping the protein to resist these raw species? And how is that done? And we can compare that to what happens in human and ALS. So to conclude, the Haglin Research Group here at UH Manoa and the chemistry department, we're interested in obesity, inflammation and cancer, tuberculosis. We're also interested in basic research and not theory. And we're very passionate about the chemical education that happens here at UH. We have an outreach program where we're developing the Aloha Biochemistry app to increase the learning and scientific thinking in the students that come to the chemistry department and take biochemistry. The app is there so we don't have to spoon feed them a lab manual following a recipe, telling them what to do, no troubleshooting and less creative thinking. We're hoping that this app will create that scientific mindset, troubleshooting, thinking outside the box, having them go through trials and errors through assignments, quizzes and exams that can be done in an app instead of feeding them the information. In the app, even the TAs might not even know what the final result is. So they are gonna test what they find in the app in the lab. We're doing this together with the collective and the app and the development of the lab course is also funded by the NSF. My undergraduate students are extremely talented and they also post every Friday, they post a fun fact Friday, both on Twitter and Instagram. And this is the latest post up to the right. And we're really excited to announce that we also have a collaboration working on an exhibit about not and not theories, not theory and not in the Polynesian culture, together with the Bishop Museum, and we also have an Instagram account called Knots in Hawaii. With that, I would like to thank my group, my graduate students, my PhD student Jennifer Simeon and Grace Orellana, my master oh, and Ivy Wu, my master student Patrick Martin, and the undergrads we have in our lab right now, Emily Kurt and Anthony Liu. All my collaborators funding agencies and all of you for listening and I'll be happy to answer any questions. So with that, I just wanna say thank you. Thank you so much, Eleanor. We really appreciate you taking all that time to tell us about your research project today. Um, really interesting stuff that you have going on in the lab. We are open for questions. So if anyone would either like to ask a question directly, you can unmute your microphone or you can type something in the chat. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Well, I'll start us off and just ask, um, I mean, you've described a lot of conditions, cellular conditions where proteins are folding, they're doing this spontaneously and they're unfolding um, frequently. It sounds like this happens really quickly. Um, and I'm wondering if, is it possible to generalize the kind of conditions in a cell that might cause misfolds where things get tangled up and become, uh, you know, non-functional at that point? Um, great question. I would believe so because we have all these inflammatory states. We have to remember that the body is made off of on and off buttons that are also proteins. So what we believe is that PLTs may act as molecular switches. We have example of proteins that are functional in the reduced state, but not in the oxidized state. Then existing in the extracellular matrix makes them inactive until a protein molecule will make and break the bond. And the reverse one is superoxide dismutase. So more research needs to be done before we can fully answer your question. But we're really interested in designing these proteins and by protein engineering and, and de novo design, can we use these proteins as drugs? Is that a smart choice, so to say, to use this on and off buttons fine-tuned by the chemical environment? So that is something we're really interested in and we don't know yet is the answer, but a great question. Oh, what did I say about ALS? So if we compare the human protein with the tuberculosis proteins, sequence-wise, they're only 19% identical. Structurally, they're very identical. So human superoxide dismutase and the tuberculosis one both have a PLT, very similar. The human protein has two metal ions and they exist as a dimer to be functional. The copper ion is there for the chemistry to convert the reactive oxygen species to non-toxic species. The zinc ion 
it's probably just there to stabilize the protein and or work on the conformational dynamics. So we're really interested in comparing that to the tuberculosis protein that does not have the zinc ion. It's the only copper zinc SOD1 that doesn't have a zinc, or one of the few, I should say. I think they have actually found a few more, but it's more common that they have both metals. And we know from the ALS or the, sorry, the human SOD that we need the dimer to be functional. We know that if I have either the disulfide link or the metal, we can form the dimer. But if you take it out, uh, so we have neither, it's not functional and it's not a dimer. When things go wrong in the cell, many of the ALS causing mutations uh, are causing uh, disease because of losing the metal or the disulfide bond or losing global stability. I know a little bit about human SOD and ALS because that was the biggest research in my PhD lab, even though I didn't work on that, but I'd be happy to answer any more questions about ALS that you might have. And I hope that answered your question, or please ask again. Thanks very much, Eleanor. Are there any other questions from anyone in our audience? I'll ask you something that's always sort of fun to find out. How did you become interested in this topic originally? Right, um, protein folding. I took a class and I thought that was the best class I ever taken and I ended up there. Um, I worked with Joanna Solkowska as a postdoc who is an expert in knots and I just discovered the threaded topology by watching him thousands and thousands of trajectories and computational work because I was brand new and I showed her and I said, why is it doing this? So it was just serendipity. We just stumbled upon it. And I happened to work with an expert in knots and we found a whole new class of proteins. My interest is actually where I started the talk. I'm really interested in nutrition and health. And I used to be an athlete. So I found it really fascinating to study energy expenditure. And that's how my interest started on leptin. And that's why I started my work on leptin already as a graduate student. And I had a great professor that let me do my own research. And the same goes for Patricia Jennings and Jose Onochik, who actually allowed me to do my own research as a postdoc, which is pretty unique and fantastic. It's wonderful how those serendipitous pathways can sometimes lead you down. Right, and it's amazing how as a scientist and a professor in academia, we have the possibility of working with combining our passions, protein folding and fitness and health. So I'm really blessed in that way that you allow me to do the work that I do here. Well, thanks so much for sharing that with us today. We really appreciate it. Um, and also, if someone wants to know, my email address is probably out there, Eleanor H, spelling my name a little bit differently. We're in Bilger Hall. Please come by and say hi. We're really happy to meet anyone to answer more questions if you have them. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Eleanor. I think we'll end our Q&A at this point, and I'd like to extend a final thank you to Eleanor for her talk and for sharing her research with us today. We really appreciate it. And thank you all for attending as well. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Um, we are gonna be taking a, a brief hiatus for the month of July, but we are going to be back with our next webinar in August. Right now we're planning for August 17th at 2 p.m. Hawaiian time and um, we're going to be having two speakers giving a joint presentation that day it's going to be hannah mounts and callie crampton and these are both researchers with the forest bird recovery projects on maui and Kauai, respectively so we look forward to seeing you all there and you can watch your email inboxes for invitations to that event have a wonderful rest of your day or evening and aloha everyone thank you so much for inviting me it was nice to meet you all